Everyone, uh, good morning. It's a pleasure to welcome you here to NUPI this morning. Uh, let me also remind you that this seminar uh, or event, breakfast meeting, will be streamed and posted also on our YouTube uh, channel. So now the question today, I think, is basically a question related. Maybe some of you experienced it th this morning. How do you talk and negotiate with difficult people? <laughs> uh, uh, no, I'm just kidding. But it's about diplomacy. Well, how to make diplomacy work, basically. How do you negotiate with difficult pe uh, people, um, in particular when trust is low? And uh, more importantly, a very pressing issue, what are the benefits and promises of diplomacy compared to, say, ignorance or military actions? And then what are the needs and requirements of successful diplomacy? I'm sure our speaker today will also touch on that. I think these are very pressing issues in an age of geopolitical tensions. And I, I think it's fair to say that both the US and the rest of the world has basically a full play today. Uh, consider the US agenda. As we speak, there's an ongoing negotiations with China on trade and economic relations. The North Korea issue is pending. Iran is pending. Venezuela is basically unfolding. There's a set of issues related to negotiations between Europe and the US, in particular Germany, but uh, on everything from Nord Stream 2 to burden sharing in NATO and trade deficits and cars and steel. And then, of course, we have the issue about Russia dealing with Russia post-Crimea. And today we have one of uh, the U.S. most experienced diplomats uh, to reflect on this issue. He's written an excellent book on his, exp on his experiences, Outpost. And uh, he is a four-time ambassador, nominated by three presidents in the U.S. He was an ambassador to Iraq for a short time. He served as an Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific As Affairs. And he also led, of course, the U.S. delegation into the six-party talks on North Korea. He was an ambassador to Poland, to uh, Re Republic of Korea, South Korea, and the Republic of Macedonia, and a special envoy, and very much in in special envoy to Kosovo, and he was also very much involved in the negotiations in the Balkans, to working together with Holbrook. And today he's the professor in the practice in diplomacy at the University of Denver. So we have a very good speaker at, uh, <laughs> with us today, very experienced one. He's also a frequently used contributor to the public debate. He writes interesting op-eds for Project Syndicate, etc. And, uh, yeah, and uh, he's also fairly opinionated. And if some of you uh, would like to see his enthusiasm and engagement also for full, you can look, click into our YouTube uh, and watch uh, when Chris li uh, were here at NUPI last time discussing the how to deal with North Korea. Very good. Uh, and that's the benefit of the streaming. You can go in and consult them afterwards. Now, before I give the floor to Chris, let me also say that uh, this uh, event today is part of a series of small meetings we have on the occasion of NUPI turning 60 years old. So in 1959, the parliament established NUPI. Uh, at that time, it was a small institute, just two people. And they got uh, a grant equivalent to $10,000 uh, at the time in 1959. Um, uh, uh, today, uh, those two people have emerged into a staff of around 60. Um, the mission is still the same, basically two, two issues. One, to contribute to academic research in the fields that are interesting or relevant for Norwegian foreign policy. And secondly, to contribute to support decision making and some kind of enlightenment of the general public or the interested public. So we try to stick to this idea of having quality in our research, to be relevant, and at the same time be a credible institution in Norwegian public life. And I think that our mission at NUPI is as important today, and maybe more important than ever before in our history. 
as the world is change, uh, facing some very significant changes, and also the Norwegian economy and our society are really experiencing some significant transitions. Now, uh, I, uh, on that note, uh, I'll give the floor to, uh, to, to Chris and he will uh, give a speech and then we will join in a conversation here later on and then we we'll open up for a Q&A. So please, Chris, great to have you back here at NUPI. Look forward to this. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, th Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this is uh, my second visit to NUPI, and uh, and I didn't know I was coming on this important birthday uh, year. So it's not the, yeah, it's the year. Yeah. yeah. So uh, congratulations on that. I um, you might wonder why uh, why am I here, and uh, I think a big uh, uh, reason is at the University of Denver we have a lot of uh, we have a lot of students uh, who have come over the years from um, Norway. And, um, you know, I always thought that the University of Denver is one of the best ski schools. I mean, they always win the uh, championships in collegiate skiing. And I thought we had all these Colorado kids who grow up with, uh, you know, their skis on. I don't know how they're born that way, but somehow they are. And, uh, but, uh, you know, it turns out, tur much to my surprise, it turns out the reason the University of Denver is such a ski champion is that we have all these Norwegian skiers. And uh, so really in collegiate and intercollegiate skiing in the um, sports and skiing in the, um, in the U.S., uh, the real question people ask each other or say to each other is, you know, are your Norwegians as good as our Norwegians? And so uh, we, um, we have really been very grateful to have this, uh, this relationship. Uh, also, I came to understand recently that even our golf team is populated by Norwegians. So uh, it's quite, uh, quite remarkable. So um, uh, it's... Um, when I was here two years ago, uh, the Trump administration had just started, and it seemed like, and I'm just going to be frank uh, with you, it seemed like we would all not survive the end of this, but uh, here we are in uh, 2019 with actually less than a year and a half uh, to go until our next uh, uh, presidential elections. So uh, we don't know what's going to happen in those next uh, presidential elections, but I can assure you there's a, a lot of excitement as we get to those uh, elections. On the uh, Republican side, it's going to be uh, President Trump standing for a second uh, term. Uh, a few people have come forward and said they will um, run against him in the, for the Republican Party nomination, but I kind of doubt there'll be much serious competition on that. On the Democratic side, uh, we have about 300 million candidates right now, and uh, we have to see how that kind of uh, is uh, winnowed down. But um, uh, to some extent, uh, you know, they're just candidates from California to New York. Um, and I think there's a great sense uh, among the Democrats that, uh, you know, if you look at the election math in the U.S., you have the West Coast pretty solidly in the hands of the Democratic Party uh, candidates, East Coast pretty solidly in the hands of the Democrats. Then if you go into the midsection or the South, the South tends to be all Republican which is quite remarkable over the years, that, but it basically started in 1964 with Barry Goldwater that the Republicans, having taken a kind of a negative stance on the civil rights bill passed by Johnson, the Republicans started winning all the southern states. That is in play right now. You could see in the 2018 um, congressional elections and governorship elections, you see the Democrats making some strides there. But the real question is the so-called upper Midwest. And this is an area which has undergone probably the most economic transformation of the um, of the country. Uh, these are people who were, you know, steel workers and uh, automobile workers and finding that their jobs have been kind of pulled out, on, out, out from under them. And, um, you know, the Democrats had the, you know, Hillary was saying, well, you all need retraining and, uh, and then you can all run, you know, daycare centers or something. And if you're some steel worker, 
and someone says, you need retraining so you can run a daycare center for five-year-olds. It just doesn't work. And so instead, President Trump gave them a message they wanted to hear, which is, I will get your jobs back. Well, he hasn't done that, but certainly the economy has continued to improve since the end of the, uh, since really the start of the Obama period. If you look at the unemployment rate, there's an unbroken, unchanged line downward in terms of unemployment, which started in the sort of 8 9% range at the end of the Bush administration and is now, believe it or not, 3.8 3 uh, 3 or 3.7 at this point. So remarkable uh, improvement in the economy. Um, and again, it hasn't gotten that much better under Trump, but it certainly hasn't gotten worse. It's gone in the right direction. So he finds himself in a very popular position in some places with the improvement in the economy. Um, and the other thing that he pledged to do is keep the United States out of these crazy wars. Um, and, you know, a lot of this idea that the United States should um, tell every country to sort of uh, uh, bend the knee, as we say in Game of Thrones, uh, but uh, that every country should somehow kind of come around to our view. Well, um, President Trump has not been very aggressive on that point, and he doesn't really sort of tell countries how to behave. And uh, today, as we speak, uh, we, uh, Viktor Orban, the, um, the Hungarian uh, leader, was just being extremely warmly uh, received in the White House. This drives everyone crazy who lives in Washington, who, you know, lives in uh, sort of New York society or whatever. But, uh, you know, the president is saying, hey, you're doing a great job. He then said, and the president is not a man of detail, he's not particularly well read and he doesn't really listen to people, but he said, oh, and everyone in Europe loves you, which was news to uh, Orban uh, and, of course, maybe news to this audience. So, uh, so uh, it, it's clear the president, you know, he, he doesn't really want to engage on these issues. He doesn't understand them particularly. He certainly doesn't want to tell Viktor Orban to change press laws or something. He doesn't know what a press law is. Uh, he just knows what a negative press is, and, and Orban has taken measures to deal with his negative press, and so Trump admires that. So um, all of this is to say we have a president who's pretty much easygoing on these foreign policy issues, except, except in the following way, which is, Foreign policy in the United States uh, is a kind of proxy issue. It does not, uh, you know, most Americans don't know foreign policy. In Colorado, many people think you're talking about Kansas when you talk about uh, foreign policy. Um, so many Americans don't really know it that, that much. Certainly they know it in places like Washington, and, you know, there are more opinions in Washington than there are uh, anything on that. But most people don't really know it. So what is, why is foreign policy so important in the U.S.? Uh, there are, as I said, there are people who have a sense of our responsibilities in the world, but the reason it's so important is it's kind of a proxy issue, a proxy variable for, are you tough? Are you a tough guy? Because that's what Americans want to see in their leader. And President Obama, who had many admirers, and for good reason had many admirers, also had a tendency to kind of think out loud. You know, he'd say, well, on this hand, there's this problem, and we've got to be careful there, but we have to be careful over here as well. And so um, that, wasn't, that didn't convey the kind of toughness that Americans want to see in their leader. My own view is if you're going to make it a proxy variable for something, it ought to be a proxy for how wise you are, you know, that you can understand these complex issues that are in other societies and may not reflect or mirror the issues that you have in the U.S. Alas, that's not what's happening. It's being tough. So who's the toughest foreign policy advisor President Trump could find? And, of course, he was uh, uh, John Bolton. Now, I, I know John Bolton. Um, he's, uh, he's not a person who's particularly interested in your uh, different viewpoints than his. He's basically on a kind of broadcast mode. For many years, he was a Fox News uh, contributor. Uh, when I was dealing, I mean, John Bolton worked for President uh, 
Bush, and then the day that it was clear that President Bush could not get him confirmed as the UN ambassador, John Bolton left, and then the next day John Bolton started criticizing President Bush for being soft on a number of issues. And uh, with regards to yours truly, he used to call me on television, Kim Jong-il, that I was uh, way, too, um, way too easy on those North Koreans. So in comes John Bolton as the toughest guy on foreign policy. But so you'd think, well, that'll go well with Trump because he's basically looking for tough guys. The problem is that John Bolton has something that's very different from President Trump, which is Bolton not only wants to be tough, but he wants to compel other countries to think exactly like he does. And so he has created a circumstance, and he's been the driver of this, where the U.S. is now beginning to enjoy the worst relationship it's had with the world in a long time, and this is John Bolton's um, legacy. Now, you might say, well, what about that uh, Secretary of, Def of uh, State who came in after uh, Secretary Tillerson? Well, Rex Tillerson uh, will go down in history as a Secretary of State who had probably the most problems understanding how his government department worked. Uh, those of us who have sort of wondered how Exxon ever survived Rex Tillerson, uh, uh, you know, just dumbfounded by the way the State Department was handled. Rex Tillerson spelled R-E-X. Everyone in the State Department started spelling it W-R-E-C-K, as in he's wrecking everything. Uh, so in comes Pompeo, and Pompeo kind of had a nice style about him. So, okay, State Department, we want to bring the swagger. Swagger is a word you don't usually use to describe the State Department. But, you know, this is kind of excessive self-confidence, which has never been the hallmark of the State Department. We're going to bring that back. And I was thinking, whoa, did we ever have that? I don't remember that. And, uh, and, but he also used the kind of nice technique of kind of reaching out to people. For example, after the Singapore summit, or the Singapore fling, or the Singapore thing, whatever we're going to call it, we'll get into that a little, um, uh, he, uh, Pompeo, you know, he's very good. You know, he calls me up, for example, and says, Chris, I just want to hear your point of view on these things. So I gave him my point of view in 30 minutes, and it was kind of pleasant. I mean, uh, you know, it's uh, when the Secretary of State calls you up and says, wait a minute, I'm taking notes. And I'm thinking, well, that's terrific. I, I don't usually take notes when I'm on the phone, but you go for it, Mr. Secretary. You know, it made you feel good. It, 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 but it was also reminiscent of that old joke of the violinist who uh, is told that the, um, the maestro, the conductor, had visited her home and uh, burned the home down and killed her uh, her siblings and everybody in the violence. You mean the maestro visited? So, <laughs> so uh, it's a little bit of a um, double-edged sword, so to speak. So, what is Pompeo doing? Well, he has taken. He basically, he, as a Secretary of State, and this is now the third in a row who's had kind of additional ambitions, uh, because. Before him was, of course, Hillary Clinton, who was famously running for president even while she was Secretary of State. So everything she did at the State Department had to be looked at through the prism, you know, how does that help her in the next presidential election. Uh, before her, of course, you had, or after her, rather, you had uh, John Kerry, who also was kind of harboring uh, even more ambitions. He said, you know, I'm a lot better candidate than I was in 04. He's um, not one of the 25 or so candidates right now, but nonetheless, he, uh, you know, there was a whiff of, the, of a guy trying to think about a presidential run. You know, before them, they had uh, Condi Rice, who was thought to be a kind of uh, possible candidate, if not for president, perhaps for vice president. And of course, Colin Powell, who was always in those terms. So it's been a long run of these people who have kind of national political uh, ambitions. So Pompeo is also assumed to have national political ambitions, if not for Senate in Kansas, maybe for a presidential run in 2024. So again, as a politician, he understood you need to reach out to people and shake their hand and show that you care about your, the organization. But you also need to be tough, because he understands the role of toughness in 
foreign policy. So um, while he's done nice things like reach out to people, he's also been very clear he does not want a situation where uh, Bolton is the tough guy and he's the guy kind of pulling back and saying, oh, we need to think this through, etc. He wants to be as tough as Bolton. So sorry for this kind of long-winded uh, uh, introduction to the uh, diplomacy of our times, but we essentially have two people. I, I hesitate to call John Bolton a diplomat, but just uh, for sakes of the argument, we'll call him and Pompeo the two leading diplomats. And um, they are in charge of U.S. diplomacy, and that is clear. So how is it going, and what is the purpose of diplomacy there? I think um, if you look at several issues, uh, they are kind of on their own. Uh, they are on their own in Venezuela. And this was, uh, Venezuela was something that uh, the, uh, I don't think Pompeo and Bolton had really given much thought to Venezuela over the decades. Uh, but they did bring in still a third, uh, uh, a th a third uh, uh, diplomat to try to uh, work on, on this point. And, uh, and, and uh, this uh, Elliot, uh, I'm having a senior moment, Elliot uh, Abrams was famous for sharing Bolton's view of regime change. So they bring in kind of another regime change guy. In fact, Abrams made a, made a actually was accused and convicted of lying to Congress over this issue uh, back in the 1980s. So, so you have a policy toward uh, Venezuela that combined some decent diplomacy, that is reaching out and getting some other um, countries to sign on to the idea that Maduro must go. But it was also, I think, a policy, um, in addition to getting those countries involved, it was a policy that kind of included the concept that maybe if we put enough military heat, the expectation that perhaps at some point there might be a military dimension to this policy, uh, Maduro might uh, get on a plane and, and leave. Well, um, it, as is often in the case in the U.S., is they kind of... Um, dispense with the sort of uh, diplomatic foreplay, if you will, and go right to the, uh, are we going to invade them or not? And so, um, so the question of, uh, you know, you have uh, John Bolton carrying this notebook into a meeting, and famously on the notebook it, it said uh, Colombia, a neighboring country, and he listed a certain number of troops. I think it said 4,000 troops or something. And so it was in very large handwriting, not the sort of stuff that you'd write notes with. So what was that about? And it was clear he was trying to say, hey, we're looking at military options. Well, at the same time, the pro remember what the president's doing. He's trying to give jobs to uh, people in the upper Midwest and, you know, or get their jobs back. So the president is not happy with this stuff. He likes the idea of being tough, but he doesn't like the idea of invading a, uh, a foreign country. So you see that Bolton is kind of pushing this. Pompeo kind of stayed in his diplomatic lane saying, well, we need to get other countries to agree with us on this. So Pompeo has been very busy on the diplomacy. But he has not done anything to slow down Bolton on, the, on the, uh, the idea that there could be a military dimension. I think President Trump has. And I think, as you saw, the miscalculation in the last week where as much as, uh, uh, as um, Bolton and, and Pompeo talked about, talked to the various regional partners about military intervention as much as they talk to the uh, 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 the leader of the opposition, the person that we recognize actually as the leader, Guido, uh, the, um, it's clear that the coup that they were saying was going to happen isn't happening. And then President Trump's kind of CEO thing kicks in, and he says, wow, you promised a result, and you're not getting the result. So big bad mark for uh, Bolton at that point, so we have to kind of watch how that's looking. But um, the president does not want military intervention, but he's all in favor of threats as long as the threats work. And when the threats don't work, I think he's, he's looking at, a, at, at an effort by Bolton that is not going well. So Venezuela, it's a complicated problem. It, uh, there's, there's an oil issue, obviously, but I, I would encourage people to understand that the U.S. is not out looking for oil. 
uh, because we've got a lot of oil on our own. And by the way, we have very few environmental regulations anymore in dealing with that oil. I mean, there are a lot of regulations coming at the state level, so, but not from the federal level. So this is not about getting Venezuela to get oil. This is more a John Bolton project that somehow a country that defies the United States must be brought to its knees. And so we have to see where that goes in the future. But uh, right now, the dynamic is President Trump is looking at his tough national security advisor, Bolton, and saying, where are the results? So watch that space. It could be an interesting uh, development. Meanwhile, something else happens, and this goes into President uh, Trump's own issues, which is in, in becoming president and in listening to the hard right in the Republican Party, he realized that anything to do with President Obama must be destroyed. Um, sort of like the speech in the Roman Senate, Carthage must be destroyed, Obama must be destroyed. So um, one of Obama's great signature pieces is, of course, the uh, JCPOA, the uh, nuclear deal with, uh, with uh, Ira uh, Iran. Now, there are the politics kind of interest. Oh, I should have mentioned before I get there that the politics on Venezuela, there are politics on Venezuela, and it's called Florida. Um, we all know about my wife, Julie, is from Florida. And she hates it when I dumb down Florida to being a set of politics. That's actually flattering for, uh, yeah. But um, what is, of course, happening in Florida is you have Cubans, and they are not indifferent to the issues of, uh, of the, uh, the president clamp, uh, reducing all the Cuban um, moves that uh, President Obama made. But they also have a lot of Venezuelans in Florida. And they tend to be very high net worth Venezuelans, and they tend to contribute to the Republican Party. So there's a lot of kind of value to pushing hard on Venezuela. But again, I think the dominant thing is what I described. It is a, um, an aide Bolton not living up to the expectations of the CEO. So moving back to, uh, to uh, Iran. So the president made very clear he wants that deal canceled. And he cancels it. it. It took a couple of iterations, and now uh, you know better than I, they're going after anyone who does anything with Iran. And uh, because of the sort of dollar-denominated international currency, uh, especially in the energy sector, uh, they feel they can uh, kind of push other countries on Iran. So that's one thing going on. But of course, um, Bolton has never been, he doesn't think this is a game of sanctions. He thinks this is a game of regime change. And uh, in the regime change, there might actually need to be a, a uh, military dimension to Iran. Well, whenever we talk about uh, issues of regime change or issues of military deployment, I'm an old-fashioned guy. I usually get out a map, and I look at the map. I think maps are very good. You, it doesn't have to be Google map. You can get a piece of paper that has a map on it. And when you look at the map, there is no good way to invade or otherwise attack uh, Iran with military force. It just is not in the rea uh, real world that we live. But if you're John Bolton, who probably has never looked at a map, uh, he looks at this and says, hmm, maybe we can realize this vision of attacking Iran and making it uh, you know, rue the day that it ever thought about nuclear weapons or ever in any way tormented the United States. So he has got this very strong view of Iran, but what else is happening there? Because you see that the military leaders, including the previous defense secretary, uh, uh, Jim Mattis, now even though Mattis was kind of opposed to taking away the uh, Iran nuclear deal on the basis that, well, we have that, and if we take it away, what are we going to do? What's, you know, uh, what's the answer to the question, and then what? Uh, and he didn't see an answer, so he supported that. But if you talk to the U.S. military, what do they think of Iran? Nobody likes Iran. You hear very few sympathetic words about Iran from the U.S. military. And why is that? Because when the U.S. military went into Iraq, there are expectations in the southern part of Iraq that the Shia population there uh, would be very sympathetic. You recall uh, then Vice President um, Cheney, 
who seems like a kindly old uncle right now, but that's another subject. Uh, Cheney saying, uh, uh, you know, they are going to throw out flowers in our path as we go forward. Well, that didn't happen. And instead, some of the Shia groups became very virulent, very tough-minded, Islamicized Shia groups whose targeting, uh, in addition to the minority Sunnis of Iraq, targeting also was on U.S. troops. And so some of the most, uh, the toughest and most successful attacks on U.S. troops in, in Iraq, including through these improvised explosive devices and various other uh, um, uh, roadside bombs whose capacity to go through armored vehicles was quite remarkable. You know, the Americans had to introduce a whole new class of, uh, of, uh, of uh, transport systems. You know, we had something called the Humvee, which you, you know, tootled around on the battlefield. Then it became the MRAP, which was this V-shaped hull so that when something exploded, maybe it would defer, you know, deflect the, the explosion. I mean, it was a huge issue. And if you look at the total of American casualties in Iraq, many were killed by the people who should have been throwing uh, roses rather than bombs. And so why were they throwing bombs? Answer, the Iranians. So there is not a lot of sympathy for, for the Iranians there. And then I'll take my own sort of meek, pleasant, nice bunch of guys in the State Department. Um, I think Maureen knows. I mean, we, uh, we, had, uh, you know, we had hostages taken by Iran in 1979. Hostages held by what was it, 444 days. I think there are 159. I can't remember. They were blindfolded every night. They were taken out for mock executions, and the Iranians would fire empty rifles at them, and they thought their life was over, and then they're still alive in this kind of psychological torture. So even in the State Department, you don't have a lot of sympathy for Iran. There's not a big contingency of people saying, well, you know, it's an important country. We need to kind of manage that. We need to work with them. Because everyone's kind of against the Iranians. Then you have, and this is true in the State Department, but it's true more broadly, you have the whole Arab uh, community. But let's just look at the issue of uh, Saudi Arabia. So the Saudis, um, they had long since gotten used to the situation in Israel. They didn't like it, but they got used to it. So, uh, but along comes the American invasion of Iraq, and we take a Sunni-led country, like every other country in the Middle East, and we flip it. We flip it to become a Shia-led country. So the Saudis, again, they know what a map looks like, and they're saying, hmm, our, our whole northern border now looks a little dangerous because we now have a Shia-led country here. We have another Shia-led uh, Iranian Persian country there. And we're seeing that Persian country now have the land bridge that it's wanted to get to the Shia populations in the, in the Levant. And so for the Saudis, this was pretty devastating stuff. And so if you're the Saudis, what uh, President Bush did Remember, they loved his father. They didn't love him because he essentially created a pathway for Iranian encroachment, Shia encroachment, in, um, in terms of solidifying the Shia government in Baghdad. And then from the Saudi perspective, by solidifying, solidifying the Shia government in Baghdad, it kind of awakened Shia feelings in Saudi's own east province. Uh, then... More recently, they've looked at the development of these Houthis. And, uh, you know, these Houthis, I mean, these are not people you necessarily want to invite to Christmas dinner. I mean, these are kind of tough-minded people. But now they also seem to be getting uh, Iranian support. And so if you're a Saudi, you begin to think, well, I've got, we've got this Shia crescent in the north, but now it seems to be expanding to, to being in the south, and it looks a little like a Shia encirclement. So along comes, so seeing all this kind of strong anti-Iranian anti feelings, so I haven't even mentioned the nuclear issue, but all of these anti-Iranian feelings, along comes President Trump, who doesn't know much about Iran, except that he doesn't have a hotel there. And I don't, I don't mean to suggest that this is about hotels, but it's about familiarity. 
but he knows what he has some sense of what what uh, the Arab world means to his business and to many other businesses in the U.S. And so he looks at the Saudis and he hears from a lot of supporters from Israel who say, you know, uh, we don't like the Saudis. We never have. They've never liked us. But they're not really targeting us. The Saudis are not our problem in Israel right now. The, Sa the real problem we Israelis have is with Iran. Remember Ahmadinejad talking about, you know, the denying the Holocaust and, uh, you know, his very rough talk toward, uh, toward the Israelis. And of course, don't forget the Syrian conflict, which has seen a massive influx of Iranian influence. So the Israelis are saying, you know, Americans, if you really want to do something good, you should try to work with the Saudis dealing with, with Iraq. Well, uh, tre President Trump is not really capable of kind of using a rheostat and going, okay, let's warm it up a little, but not too much. After all, they are killing people in places like consulates in Istanbul. So we'll just turn it up a little, the warmth meter. And so before you know it, you have a president who has gone to Saudi Arabia, and he basically decides the Saudis, they're our guys. We should do what they want. Why should we do what they want? Because they're against the Iran, and maybe, if what these people are saying, maybe they'll even cut a deal with Israel. So I think a lot of what the Trump administration has looked to the Saudis to do is if we do everything they want, they will use their influence by telling Fatah, look, Fatah, you've got to help out here, and, and uh, marginalizing, maybe even vanquish, uh, vanquishing Hamas in the Gaza Strip. So this is kind of the concept. We'll do everything the Saudis want us to do, and then they will uh, help us out and we will be able to create a new um, paradigm in the Middle East. So in every way you can figure out the politics, the Iranians lose. So one of the criticisms, of course, is that uh, the Iranians, despite maybe some success on hope holding down their nuclear ambitions, and even the Trump administration has to agree with the IAEA that there has been success in terms of implementing the GC JCPOA, they don't see any success in Syria. Not that President Trump wants to uh, do more in Syria. He was happy to keep it a very, uh, very uh, clear mission against ISIS. But... Um, uh, the idea that somehow we can get a situation where by pushing on the Iranians, maybe even changing the regime, back to John Bolton's uh, ambitions there, we can kind of create the world sa uh, a safer world for, for Saudi Arabia, and then they're going to help us out in Israel, and we're going to have a Middle East peace plan. So people say there's no strategic vision in, um, in the Trump administration. Sadly, there is. I mean, they have these giant visions. The trouble is, like a lot of visions, it's not true. <laughs> and I don't think the Saudis are going to help solve the Israel-Palestine uh, issue. But uh, if you look at where the Middle East has been, uh, it was understandable to say we needed to, um, we need to deal with the, uh, get one of these elements, maybe not Turkey, because that was always a player, but they're difficult to deal with. Maybe not uh, Egypt, because they have their own problems, but we'll maybe stand up the Saudis and they'll be able to, uh, to do more. So the criticism of the JCPOA was why didn't it deal with uh, the regional issues? You know, why didn't they... they uh, um, you know, start dealing with the, with the Kutz Force activities, which, by the way, has now been labeled a terrorism or a terrorist organization. So, um, and the answer, again, these are details that fall below Trump's notion of kind of looking at things in very, very big terms. These are details that don't really hit his field of vision. And so the answer was, the, ironically, the Saudis didn't want an element of the JCPOA dealing with regional affairs, unless they were there, unless the Emiratis were there, et cetera, and turn into a Middle East conference. No one, including the Obama administration or the Europeans, really wanted to turn a clean nuclear deal into a, or not clean nuclear, but a nuclear deal only into a, uh, into a regional peace process. So to explain that to President Trump is to give details that he cannot absorb. So. Right now, we are in a situation where um, 
there have been, we have turned up the volume on what the Iranians are saying to each other and doing, and there seem to be some indications that some Iranians are saying, well, why don't we go uh, make life a little more difficult for those American troops in our neighbor, in our friendly neighbor's territory of Iraq. And that caused a certain alarm in U.S. government circles, but it also caused a certain element of, uh, of excitement because this is maybe what we need. And so you recall just a couple of weeks ago, Secretary Pompeo blew off, as we say in colloquial English, blew off a, an appointment with the German Chancellor uh, and ran off to, um, to Baghdad to speak to Adel Abdelmekti, who's a really nice guy. Uh, but what was that all about? And it seems to be all about the effort to say, hey, we've got a, a looming problem in, a, in, uh, in, uh, with the Iranians. It's getting worse, and we don't have time for European chit-chat. We need to go there and start dealing with this. So we've got a growing crisis in, uh, in Iran. Uh, and frankly, uh, as of this morning, you saw U.S. starting to talk about m moving troops there. Sometimes these things can become a self-fulfilling prophecy. And if you start talking about plans to move 100,000 troops, uh, sometimes you actually move the 100,000 troops. And so this is something we need to watch very carefully. But I think we need to remember that President Trump, he wants to talk, he wants to bluster, he does not want to go to war. So we have, I think, a, uh, a looming crisis, and the question is, will he say to Bolton, you know, I saw what you were doing in Venezuela, didn't really work, is this another one of those situations, because I don't want to be in war with Iran. We have to watch that carefully. Meanwhile, and this will be the last point, uh, those wonderful, cuddly, just want to pick them up and hug them, North Koreans. Uh, so, <coughs> President Trump, and I won't go through the whole history of this, but is, uh, after a fall, the fall of 2017, uh, where President Trump was talking about, uh, you know, my button is bigger than your button, uh, fire and fury, all this kind of stuff. I mean, it was quite remarkable. By December of 2017, uh, uh, Americans who were contemplating surviving the visit by their relatives at Christmas time were now contemplating surviving a nuclear war because it looked like it was getting really out of hand. And then on January 1st, Kim Jong Un said, uh, uh, "Actually, I'd like to meet with. Uh, I'd like to calm things down with the Americans." The South Koreans got this message. They were very excited about it. War on the Korean Peninsula is not something anyone on the Korean Peninsula wants. It's something that you want over in a think tank in Washington because that's a safe distance from war on the Korean Peninsula. So the South Koreans were a little worried about this. They sent a delegation to meet with then, this was before Bolton, uh, they, they met with uh, then uh, National Security Advisor McMaster, and they met in his office, and they said, you know, we've just followed up on the New Year's Day address, and uh, we think the North Koreans may, either, we detect a kind of change of mood there. And before, uh, uh, and we'd like to, we want to, deliver a message that he asked us to convey. And before uh, McMaster had the opportunity to say, well, what's that message? President Trump walked into McMaster's office and says, hey, why don't you come all over to the, uh, to the uh, Oval Office? And uh, so they go into the Oval Office. Uh, the uh, Director of National Intelligence was not used to having meetings in the Oval Office. That's something only the Korean president normally has, so he was kind of nervous about all this. And, but the president says, President Trump says, oh, no, come on over. So they sit down in the Oval Office, and they tell the president uh, that uh, we need, uh, that the North Korean president would like to meet with him. Well, being a traditional diplomat, my reaction to that would be to tell the president, to tell them, Thank you very much for coming all this way and conveying this very important invitation. It really is a very important thing that you've done, and I need to talk this over with, our, with my advisors, and we will get you an answer as soon as possible because we really believe this is something very important, and congratulations to your diplomacy for having this. 
So, no, there wasn't any, I need a little, I need five minutes to talk to my advisors. Rather, it was, yes, great idea, when do we start? So, uh, so that kind of led up to Singapore. Now, in Singapore, those of us who've spent uh, too much time uh, dealing with the North Koreans and then too much time in therapy about dealing with the North Koreans, I'm joking about that, but uh, uh, would say, you know, let's prepare this summit. Let's, let's actually talk to the North Koreans and normally, and by the way, I still think there's value in the word normal, uh, but you know, in a normal circumstance, you would go to the North Koreans and say, we're very pleased that our leaders are going to have this opportunity to meet in Singapore, and uh, we would like this to be a very successful meeting. And so we have very modestly uh, put together a piece of paper called a draft joint communique, and we would like you to consider this draft joint communique, and we are prepared to stay here as long as you like, and we could have a little discussion. Well, that never happened. That never happened. And so what we saw, of course, in Singapore was uh, the president walking in the garden with his uh, best friend forever, uh, Kim Jong-un, said, oh, we're going to have a signing ceremony. And so the signing ceremony, no one knew what they were going to sign, but uh, they go into this meeting, and I remember it's quite remarkable. There are all this mahogany uh, wood of uh, this beautiful hotel in uh, Singapore. Out walks uh, President Trump and Kim Jong Un. President uh, uh, Kim Jong Un has his sister turn the pages of this agreement, which no one knew what it said. But uh, so his, he has his sister turning the pages while he signs and initials the pages. President Trump had his Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, turning the pages. There's a little asymmetry there. I mean, uh, <laughs> President Trump might have found his sister to do that, to, to have, again, the idea of reciprocity and sort of doing things on an equal, forget it. That's old school stuff. And then uh, <coughs> no one knew it was in this agreement, so the president signs this, and then he does what he often does in these agreements. He has that big chainsaw signature, and then he holds it up and smiles, and then some Japanese journalist took a picture of it with an iPhone, and uh, that's how we knew what was in the agreement. Um, so as we went through the agreement, there was a lot to be a little concerned about, a lot to be uh, more than a little concerned about, which is, yes, there was a commitment to the idea that uh, uh, North Korea will give up its nuclear weapons. It's a good thing, but uh, we still, it was still not clear when. And, you know, if you're a communist, I mean, remember the ideology, the state will eventually wither away. So you have these kinds of end of days, almost biblical concepts in Marxism that when something will actually happen. You know, when the state withers away, that's when, you know, there's no need for communism or there's no need for building socialism, et cetera. Well, uh, at this point, of course, the, um, uh, uh, the North Koreans say they're in favor of denuclearization, but no clear uh, concept of when it would happen. And is it a biblical end of days kind of concept, you know, when the lions lie down with the lambs, et cetera. By the way, there's a um, museum in Israel where they have a lion and a lamb. And I remember saying to the guy, well, how do you get the lion and the lamb to lie down together? And he said, well, we have a different lamb every night. Uh, so, uh, so this didn't get us too far. But more importantly, there was a commitment to a further, further summit. But at that point, something bad started to happen. The North Koreans got less interested. And uh, the, the president did, or Pompeo did, uh, appo appoint someone to be his, uh, his uh, um, nuclear negotiator with North Korea. He was a former Coca-Cola lobbyist and Ford Motor Company lobbyist. But he had worked as a kind of uh, chief of staff in the White House under George W. Bush. Steve Began, he's a very talented guy. Uh, but he was unable to even get a meeting with the North Koreans until December. And uh, it's pretty clear the North Koreans were kind of going slowly on this. But in the meantime, there's a new national security advisor who hates this, John Bolton. He hates this idea. So he's been looking to sort of make this not possible. And he uses the one point that often works with President Trump. If you go ahead with this thing, you're not looking tough. And President, oh, I'm not looking tough. That's right. You're not looking tough. And so the North Koreans put together a kind of interesting proposal in uh, Hanoi in, at the end of March, 
And by kind of interesting is they, they took the main nuclear facility in Yongbyon, and, uh, which is a huge uh, facility, I think about three kilometers long or so, and uh, they proposed to dismantle it. And uh, if I had been there, I would have said, uh, okay, uh, let's go through this building by building. What are you going to do with the reprocessing facility? What are you going to do with the, uh, the cooling pond? What are you, and just kind of go through it individually. Because we know they, have a, a, uh, they don't have missile development there. It doesn't get at the issue of nuclear materials already, built, already made. And, of course, it doesn't get at the question of whether they have additional highly uh, enriched uranium facilities. But it's the only uh, plutonium facility they've got, and we know that as a fact. And there is one, at least one uranium enrichment facility, which we could have gotten a look at if they, are, they were prepared to have U.S. observers of this process. Uh, so there was a lot of interesting elements to it, but instead it got rejected within five hours. Um, some of the uh, after-summit discussion was, well, they wouldn't give us details. Okay, if they're not giving any details, that's a problem. Secondly, there was the question of what the North Koreans were wanting in, in return, and they may have been asking for a lot of sanctions relief. Now, the sanctions relief that has been most successful, we think, is the idea that they have, um, is the idea that they, they cannot get gasoline from China. That is, those deals where they would ship coal to China and China was ship gasoline and other petroleum products to them, those were, those were stopped or, or limited, severely limited. So if the North Koreans wanted that reversed and then were just giving some vague promises about a place that in some parts of it were obsolete, no deal. I guess my concern is whether we really took the time to figure out whether that's in fact what was offered. And I don't take the North Korean positions at face value, but I'd be a little skeptical when John Bolton says something's not good enough because what he wants the North Koreans to do is strip to their underwear, and uh, I don't think anyone is prepared to do that. Uh, and the idea of Kim Jong-un and his underwear is not something I want to <laughs> contemplate. So, so here we are. We have a North Korean diplomacy that is beginning to fall apart, uh, where there is an inadequate uh, diplomatic structure, we have an Iran situation where, is, where there is, frankly speaking, an insincere diplomacy, where we don't have any, any discussions, any connectivity with the, with the Iranians, not even with our University of Denver graduate Javed Zarif. We have a Venezuelan diplomacy that doesn't seem to have worked very well, and we have a Saudi diplomacy that seems to put an excessive trust in an untrustworthy partner, the Saudis. So um, it's not looking very positive uh, right now. Uh, I think the, uh, oh, and of course, meanwhile, uh, Bashar al-Assad is still there. You know, if some of these dictators would devote as much attention as they do to staying in power to, you know, building modern economies and uh, institutions, et cetera, they'd be great leaders. Uh, because Bashar al-Assad is really a survivor, and uh, I don't think he's going anywhere. And I think that whole situation needs to be rethought. So um, the Trump administration has 18 months to wrap this all up. Uh, some people say they have four years plus 18 months. Um, the mood in the U.S. is that despite the, in, the continued uh, economic recovery, Despite the uh, low unemployment, the mood in the U.S. is that Trump is not going to be reelected. His base has never really expanded to a majority. Um, there is, I think, an understanding that he does not have the temperament, let alone the wisdom, to deal with these issues. And, um, and with respect to foreign policy, no, he's not looking tough. He's looking a little disorganized, and I think the hit in the stock market in the last week over China kind of speaks to the 
notion that can you really trust this man with your retirement income. Uh, and so I think we're probably looking at a new uh, leadership. Uh, who that is, uh, there are a lot of good candidates, um, but uh, we're probably looking at someone new. And then we're looking at a huge project to rebuild America's uh, uh, position in the world to uh, maybe learn from some of these mistakes uh, and perhaps to learn from some of the mistakes that led us to these mistakes. Uh, because I do feel that the neoconservatives who uh, behaved in a certain way over the uh, course of the Bush administration and even among the sort of so-called democratic or uh, uh, liberal hawks of the Obama administration, Susan Rice, etc., I think all of those led to where we are with the Trump administration. I think the U.S. needs to kind of uh, regroup on our foreign policy and see if we can have a little more diplomacy and uh, a little less of what we've had. So thank you very much, and we'll go to a more interactive. You can just sit down here, and then we can open up for a, a conversation. <laughs> we also open up for, for a Q&A. Um, but before we start, could you just say a few words also about another important negotiation going on, China? Uh, you have painted a picture basically saying that uh, uh, in a lot of the foreign policy conversations, it's, uh, it's Trump setting some kind of parameters, yeah. uh, but without having much of uh, in-depth knowledge. Yeah. But he has some kind of intuitions about where he wants to go. Right. And, and he has somehow delegated then to the action to, to some very few people, uh, Bolton and Pompeo. Right. Uh, now, uh, and somehow sidelined a bit of the expertise and the State Department. That, that, I, that I take is yes. your overall assessment somehow. Uh, now, uh, the China negotiations are, are they following the same somehow pattern? Uh, because there you have Trump also pretty strong and then you have yeah. uh, some of his team also pretty <laughs> strong. Yeah. Uh, how would you uh, characterize them, these negotiations compared to, for instance, to some of the others? Yeah, uh, first of all, I should have at least given enough uh, as much room to discussing China as I did to Venezuela because uh, I would say China is a little more important. Um, a couple of things going on on China that I think we need to bear in mind. China, I think the um, Xi Jinping's decision not to have the uh, succession model uh, has been a uh, seminal moment in dealing with China. So Xi Jinping's decision essentially to make himself president for however long he wants to be president, president for life maybe, is um, is a symbol of the fact that China's own political development has taken a different turn. I think we need to recognize that and recognize the challenge that we're up against. Secondly, I think uh, the trade issues with China, um, I think there's a point at which every country looks at another country and says, can we, do we have a reliable partner here? Can we make concessions th such that those concessions will be uh, agreed to and we can move on? Or in the case of the Trump administration, are we making concessions that might just be revisited a few months later? And I think China is kind of at that point with the Trump administration with an eye on the calendar and saying maybe, you know, this isn't going to work, and therefore we don't want to try to make some historic deal. The fact um, we know most about Trump from his tweets, and his tweets seem to indicate his concern that China would rather deal with someone else. Now, he's, of course, said China would rather deal with the Democrats because he, uh, they're weak and China will get a better deal with them. And by the way, they're not going to win. I'm going to win, et cetera. Mm. Well, I think uh, it's not so much China thinks they'll get a better deal from the Democrats. It's more they feel that the deal they get is a deal that will stick because they'll be dealing with sort of normal, uh, no more normal situations. So that's, 
that's going on right now. And the real question is how much of the stock market slide is, is Trump prepared to accept? It's one thing to say to the Carpenters Union, all right, I'm not going to pay you guys for the project you did because I don't trust you in the next project or whatever. This is different. And he's messing with uh, pension funds. He's meant messing with a lot of different uh, people in the U.S. I suspect that there will be an effort to get back to him and say, look, Mr. President, we need to calm this down. But he's a stubborn guy, and he does think he's, he's right. Um, my own view on China, as difficult as it is to work with them, I think it's more difficult to work against them. And for that reason, I would continue the search for some patterns of cooperation and I would uh, get them into the diplomatic architecture of North Korea. I don't think we're going to get there with North Korea if China's not a part of it. Um, I do believe, and I'm a minority in this regard, I do believe that the North Koreans can be convinced that they have a worse future with n nuclear weapons than they do without nor nuclear weapons. I think that's a proposition that maybe even Kim Jong-un himself has come to understand. It's not that he believes that somehow president will, will build beachfront condos on the North <laughs> Korean coast, I, I, which actually did come yeah. up. I, I'm not exaggerating. Uh, but, uh, but I think there's an understanding among the North Koreans that, um, among some North Koreans, that maybe they, they have a worse future with weapons. Uh, I think if there's any hope in ever turning that perhaps nascent understanding into policy, it has to involve the Chinese. And there is no stomach for involving China. And I'll mention, for example, the Secretary of State, who's quite peripatetic, he's all over the place. Uh, in fact, where is he today? Was he in Brussels today or? In Pompeo, yesterday. Yeah, yeah, yesterday in Brussels, but today, Sochi. Sochi, Sochi right. yeah. He's all over the place. Well, one place he hasn't been in about six months or eight months is China. So uh, why hasn't he been in China? Well, here's what happened. The Vice President, Pence, if you remember him, uh, he uh, gave a very unfortunate speech at the Hudson Institute where he kind of laid out the future with China as the past with the Soviet Union. He basically laid out a sort of trying to, a little pompous, but trying to be the new sort of uh, uh, Cold War speech of Churchill. Well, the Chinese, they read everything, unfortunately. Uh, they probably even read the sports page. But uh, they looked at that speech, and they were not amused. So Pompeo visited, came to China, and he met with Wang Yi. And you know, China had all these TV cameras, and they hold, uh, shake hands. And Wang Yi, rather impolitely, uses that occasion in front of a lot of Chinese television cameras to criticize the vice president's speech while hold, holding the, uh, shaking the hand of the American uh, Secretary of State. Well, Pompeo was deeply offended, and so he hasn't gone back to China. You know, look, we all get offended, uh, but life goes on, and here we are, whatever it is, seven or eight months later, and so he still hasn't gone back to China. We need a much more serious China policy than just looking at whether uh, we can make their bicycle parts and sneakers more expensive. Uh, interesting. Just a few weeks ago, we had the Chung In Moon here. Uh, yeah. uh, he's the advisor for the president yeah. on uh, North Good Korea. Man. You yeah. know him, uh, probably. Yeah. And, and I think that there were two or three things that he said, then uh, returning to the issue yeah. of North Korea. First, uh, uh, he said uh, the interesting thing is you, you mentioned uh, Steve Began. Yeah. He, he gave us a speech at Stanford. Yes. Right, and in that speech, he basically outlined, let's say, I, I would say, a policy towards North Korea that probably would be a bit more consistent with your views. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then uh, just a few weeks later, somehow, that policy was slightly, not slightly, but com almost completely turned around. Yes. Uh, so this is the same guy somehow being responsible for North Korea. 
Uh, Correct. Yeah. Uh, what and, happened? Huh? You're asking what happened? Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. So be, because I think you alluded somewhat to that, basically saying that. Uh, the, so maybe you can say a few words about why. Why did he give that speech at first? Uh, basically presenting one view, one pathway, and then uh, the U.S. somehow turning things completely around. Yeah. Uh, first of all, you're absolutely right. It was a good speech. I, I think. He, he did kind of allude to the need for more diplomatic architecture. He didn't mention China, but he did allude to the need for more architecture. And more importantly, he said the North Koreans have made an offer, and we need to explore that offer and uh, you know, figure out uh, what's in it. And then, as you said, a few weeks later, it seems to be um, a very different uh, viewpoint. One, I think it had to do with uh, Bolton, if not Bolton, then Boltonism. That is, Bolton uh, was saying, there's nothing there. We need to turn up the heat on the North Koreans. And I think Bolton was the reason they uh, removed themselves from uh, uh, Hanoi so quickly. But I think it also corresponds with a, with a time where you recall in Hanoi, the uh, president's personal lawyer, Michael Cohen, was uh, testifying to Congress. And I think the president... There's a body of opinion that says the president just was so distracted by that, he said, okay, great, great, let's get out of here. And um, meanwhile, in effect, subcontracting the North Korean offer to John Bolton. Well, uh, I think when John Bolton looks at any diplomatic offer, uh, he's very skeptical, and, you know, Lord knows with North Korea you have to be skeptical. But I don't quite understand why the U.S. side said the North Koreans didn't give any details. I mean, was it really a situation where we asked specifically about, uh, you know, the cooling pond or something, and the North Koreans said, we can't tell you? Is that really what happened? In which case, you should conclude the negotiations. Or was it we didn't want to hear from the North Koreans? And that's with, with Bolton, who's so dead set against this. I think he basically decided that he didn't want to... Uh, listened to the North Koreans and wanted it to sound like a failure. Pompeo, who shows an amazing kind of loyalty to President Trump, but also has to balance that loyalty with a concern that we're looking weak in front of the North Koreans. And I think to some extent Pompeo has turned his attention from being 100% loyal to the president to thinking about how he's being perceived, especially as as uh, Bolton is kind of taking this very hard line, and he doesn't want to be seen as the guy who's holding, you know, who's pursuing a more moderate position. And then there were rumors that Began was going to be fired for that speech at Stanford. Uh, so, I I think we have a. Um, we have a situation where the diplomacy needs some injection of, uh, of effort. Um, I don't think we're in a position to work with the Chinese on that. And the Russians, they, they don't want nuclear weapons in North Korea. Russians agree with us on that. But again, I don't think they have shown a, an interest in being helpful on anything for a long time. Okay, uh, let me have one final question before we open the floor. And, and it's probably a, a long uh, question, so I'm going to, this, uh, and it really, because it's fairly easy to criticize the president and some of his team. Target-rich uh, environment, right, right. <laughs> Yes, yeah. yes. Right, but if we look uh, somehow at some of the deeper structural issues going on, I think that's really important as well. Uh, now, uh, this Christmas I spent the time reading two books. One is uh, Michael Lewis's book, The Fifth Risk. It's about, uh, you know him, sure, you're sure. a Red Sox fan, right? So he, he wrote uh, the book, um, some of you have seen the movie, Moneyball, uh, but he's a, he's a great uh, writer. Um, and he wrote a book about government, basically about uh, how the Trump administration is also dismantling uh, government agencies. Um, and then I read the book by uh, Ronald Farrow about war on peace. Yeah. It's about... Uh, uh, you can have all kinds of views on that, but it's about uh, basically uh, the slow and gradual erosion of diplomacy and the State Department. I'm somehow. not sure how slow or gradual it no, is. No, okay, but, but uh, yeah. he, uh, he, he indicates that yeah. it started prior to Trump. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah. Right. Anyway, so uh, and we see this in budget reductions as well. So, uh, so that brings me to the issue about kind of what is the relationship between policy and decision makers and on top on the one hand, and then a professional administration on the other hand. So because you have a great uh, diplomacy as well, you have huge staffs, you have uh, quite massive resources, uh, and I think that. Uh, if you study public administration or diplomacy, you're a professor in the field, you said, oh, okay, diplomacy, there are at least three different deeds or tasks associated with being a public servant. On the one hand, you have to be, of course, be loyal to your leaders. But at the same time, you have to some extent be neutral in the sense that also the next government will have to put trust in you. Yeah. And then you have the third element, and that's the professional integrity. There's a, there's a professional aspect to this where you can say, okay, you might want to do this uh, out of political reasons, but this is what we should do according to the law or according to obligations, or this is what we would do, this is my best professional assessment. Yeah. So in some sense, what you are indicating is also a massive, I would say, massive undermining or, let's say, loss on behalf of the professional integrity of uh, U.S. diplomacy. Uh, so could you say a few words about the relationship between the, the yeah. leaders and, and the, the system somehow? Well, uh, first of all, you mentioned those three things, and, but all three of those things are highly related, this issue of loyalty. This Neutrality uh, and the professional integrity, yeah. They're, they're very much related, and, uh, you know, I was working with... Uh, in the George W. Bush administration, and uh, you know, I didn't like everything there, but uh, you know, you had to uh, sort of always do this calculation: Are you comfortable doing what you're doing? Because if you're not, you should leave. <laughs> you know, you, you shouldn't be leaking. You shouldn't be uh, undermining. You should leave. Um, but I, I felt pretty comfortable with it. Um, I mean, one time. I'm just real quick, there was a, I was supposed to, I was going to see the North Koreans, but I was told I had to have the Chinese there, and this was to restart the six-party talks. So uh, the Chinese were not there, and so uh, according to my instructions, I should have walked out of the meeting because the Chinese were not there. And I looked at the situation, I, I looked at what the North Koreans were prepared to do, which was what our objective was, to get restart the six-party talks. and. Uh, I tried to reach the Chinese relentlessly, tried to reach them. We were in Beijing, and they, uh, literally they would not answer the phone at the foreign ministry on a Saturday. And so I decided just to um, go through the meeting anyway. Um, Secretary Rice uh, was not happy that the Chinese didn't show, but she backed me up. She backed me up because I made a, what we call an American football, an audible. I made a decision right at that second that this is what we needed to do and they backed us up they backed me up and so i've backed them up i backed them up uh so it's always you know it's never as easy as to say you just 100 percent loyal 100 percent you know do everything uh that they want you to do you have to um you still have to keep a brain and and say look i'm, I'm in the best position to understand this situation therefore i'm going to have to use my judgment in this particular instance. Um, so that happens all the time. Uh, but what is happening today is something different. And uh, in some ways, it is a long-term issue. Um, and that, that is, um, excess to a great extent, foreign policy in the United States is taking on the appearance of something that is for sale. Uh, it's for sale in terms of ambassadorial assignments, where there are more and more political appointees. Look, we've always had political appointees. But to turn political appointees into an exercise in who raised more money during the campaign, that's a change. Uh, I was reading a history book about uh, uh, Ulysses Grant, a famous Civil War general 150 years ago. Who, but I was reading also about his presidency, and he was kind of saying, you know, do I send this guy out to France or do I send this guy? And there are political appointees, but they're extremely qualified people. There's less of that right now. They're only qualified in terms of raising money, and I think that's a big problem. 
And uh, the other thing is that increasingly you have this think tank community, we love think tanks, don't get me wrong, <laughs> but we have uh, this think tank community in Washington where you know, one think tank thinks they're just kind of the holding pen for people to come in during a Democratic administration, Democratic Party administration. The other, another think tank thinks they're the holding pen to come in when there's a Republican Party administration. And at some point you have to wonder well, where do the career people fit into this? Because when people come in for what they think will be a four-year period, um, they aren't necessarily looking in the long term, they're looking to make to do something and get something done in the short term. And I think that is a problem, and that problem never existed in the past. So that's kind of a function of uh, sort of a complex... Polarization, uh, maybe. Yeah, yeah, polarization, exactly. So um, I think we have a problem. But uh, I think we have a special problem when one party has made it its anthem that somehow uh, people who work in the government are stupid and foolish and lazy. And uh, so I think too often there's this kind of negativity toward uh, civil servants. And we can't seem to turn that around. I mean, even the tragic death of Chris Stevens turns into a political football as to over whether Hillary Clinton should have done a better job of protecting her ambassador in, in, uh, in uh, Benghazi. And by the way, when you're ambassador and you want to go to another part of your country, you don't check with Washington, you do it. Uh, so this had nothing to do with her or anyone else, but it turned it into politics. So um, whereas Clausewitz predicted you know, what was it, the early part of the 19th century, he predicted total war. Uh, he did not predict total politics, and that's what we have right now. Uh, two, 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 two points there. First, uh, and, uh, just a clarification, NUP is non-partisan. Uh, non okay, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. And the second... Well, that's uh, what Brookings says, too. The, uh, yeah. yeah, right, right. <laughs> uh, 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 and, the, uh, and the second thing is that... Yeah. Uh, it's interesting that, that gonna, it seems that uh, uh, the president thinks that if you're, s if you're so smart, why do you work in the public sector? Yeah. Right? So somehow yeah. there's a, um, this is a bit of a, it's difficult to grasp the idea that you can really be a clever and brilliant public servant and not be a millionaire. Right, so, yes. so there's a bit of this... Uh, That's uh, a problem too, uh, because unfortunately in my country, excessively, excessively, because it happens everywhere, but how much money you make is sort of how you keep score. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we opened up the floor. Uh, we have uh, some excellent people. Uh, uh, Inga, uh, she will be the new ambassador to, J to Japan, and she's leading oh. uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, well, Northeast congratulations. Asia section. It's a great please, job. Inga, right. Please, great to have you here. At the moment, I'm heading the section for East Asia and uh, Pacific in the yeah. ministry. Um, I just wanted to ask uh, you to uh, say a little bit more about uh, your thoughts on uh, how to handle uh, North Korea from the American perspective uh, with all the difficulties uh, you currently uh, seem to have yeah. with China, uh, with all the yeah. talk in Washington being on decoupling and uh, kind yeah. of coalescing around uh, a total split between, uh, between uh, the China and the U.S. in yeah. many respects. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, you also see uh, both Japan and also Russia wanting to get in on the North Korea game, uh, each from their angle. Yeah. Uh, what are the prospects for actually getting a hand on developments in North Korea in the time to come? First of all, um, my own view of uh, North Korea's nuclear ambitions have to do with an ambition to um, uh, eventually create a circumstance where the U.S. is not on the Korean Peninsula, where we're out. I think that's what they're interested in. Uh, you know, it's all in the family. So if you look at Kim Il-sung's uh, unfulfilled uh, ambitions to unite the Korean Peninsula, why were they unfulfilled? Because he ran into the U.S. military. So I think this is really in the minds, in the DNA, if you will, of North Korean leadership that you have to get the U.S. out. It is not about the idea that we are threatening them and therefore they need nuclear weapons to protect against this ever-present threat. Uh, you hear that a lot and that therefore we need a peace treaty with them. I, I have no problem with a peace treaty and it's fine, but it 
needs to be understood. We are not threatening them. We are not interested in invading North Korea. And uh, so this idea that they need nuclear weapons to protect against that is, is not true. They need nuclear weapons to create a circumstance where we don't want to be there because the chance of them attacking our civilian areas, may they talk a lot about civilian casualties from the Korean War. And so the idea that they would attack our civilians in Los Angeles, well, that's not a 0% probability. I don't know how much higher than zero it is, but it's not zero. And so I think that uh, they're hoping that creating a, a circumstance where it's greater than zero would create a circumstance where a future U.S. president would say, do we really need troops here? I mean, after all, the South Koreans are very competent. They have one of the best militaries in the world. We really don't need them there. And I would say, I mean... You'll be in a better position than I to answer this question. Right now, Japanese attitudes to U.S. troops in Japan are very positive. You know, it's, it's very strong. But what if there are no U.S. troops in Korea? And Japan becomes the only country in Asia to have U.S. troops, who, by the way, came in 1945 uh, not to play baseball, but rather to occupy a vanquished power. And so... I think if Japan has the only troops in Asia, U.S. troops in Asia, I don't think that can continue forever either. So I think there's a lot of good reasons why the U.S. needs to make clear to the North Koreans we're going to keep our troops in South, in South Korea. We're not interested in using those troops in any offensive way. They're there pursuant to the uh, treaties with South Korea and with, with Japan for, the, for defense. Um, I think China is kind of interested in the idea of U.S. troops out of South Korea. I think that is appealing to them. And they've admitted it. I, I was over there with a, with a think tank, in fact, uh, Carnegie, uh, and talking to the Chinese. And I remember I asked the Chinese, I said, well, what, if, um, what about U.S. troops in Japan? And there was a little discussion. The Chinese said, well, you know, we don't like them. They're there. And I said, really? You don't want our troops in Japan? And actually, they do want our troops in Japan. <laughs> Again, very complicated. And these things are not direct. You know, people aren't thinking about, you know, World War II when they say this. But, you know, the, the thought process is a little more complex than that. So um, my own view is that uh, it is understandable for Russia, Japan, and uh, and China to be at the table, and South Korea too. And I continue to believe in the logic of the six-party talks. I'm not saying the six-party talks are better able to solve the problem. I think it does. Uh, it's a better format that everybody's there because then the North Koreans cannot go out shopping for a better deal. And I think even Kim Jong-un realized that when he went to Vladivostok. He did not get a better deal from Putin. He got sympathy, but he didn't get a better deal. So I would like to see some recreation of the six-party talks. But you have to remember that we have an administration that sort of thinks the way Paul Pot thought in Cambodia, meaning this is year one. Nothing before happened. <laughs> and so... I hope we do get back to a multilateral framework. And by the way, from the point of view of the, of the American representative at that, I didn't feel, you know, encumbered by the other delegations. I, feel, I felt emboldened by the other delegations. I mean, the North Koreans would say something very annoying, and believe me, they work on annoying things to say every day. And I remember I stood up, I said, I'm not going to deal with you today. And I go to the Chinese and I tattletale, like going to the teacher. I say, you know, you deal with these guys because I'm not going to deal with them. And, you know, we had those kinds of capacities to bring additional pressure. I, I think there's a lot of good things that can be said, plus the fact that we act as a team. And diplomacy is a team sport. It's a team sport, you know, there's more people in the State Department than Mr. Pompeo, and he needs to understand that. And he needs to empower people. I mean, when I... When I went to Asia, everyone knew that Condi Rice was sending me there. So I was stronger because Condi Rice was clearly supporting that she had me going there. She had Dan Freed going to Europe. We were, we were empowered. And I, I see with Pompeo, it's only him. You know, that's a problem. But then it's also a problem when it's only Pompeo and not, uh, and not the Japanese there and not the Koreans and the Chinese. So we need to do a much better job of understanding the team concept of diplomacy both internationally and nationally. 
Okay, uh, I see time is running. Can you can we we start the five minutes late or something? Can we do five minutes over? And then Hendrik and Kari first, and then over there in the back. So is it okay to collect? Yeah, sure. Or, you or have to help me because I have ah, trouble okay. remembering. Uh, okay, yeah. I'll, I'll help. Okay, Henrik first. Uh, Henrik, I'm a researcher here with Nupi. Um, thank you very much for a, for a great uh, talk. Uh, I have a question in North Korea uh, also and the future sort of prospects. Yeah. Uh, the North Koreans conducted a short-range missile test uh, recently. So I uh, wanted to, to get your opinion. Do you see this as the North Koreans sort of upping the ante? And then in addition, I was wondering if you could say a little bit about the alliance management uh, perspective on it. because. Pompeo's statement after that test was basically, look, look the North Koreans kept their promise. It's a short-range uh, thing. It's not a uh, long-range one. So I'm hence, it's yeah. sort of okay, which no, would seem not. worrying to, yeah. to particularly yes. South Koreans. Yeah, yeah. And, and then the uh, Kari. That was three important questions yeah, right okay. there. But yeah. we'll go to another one. It's all right. I, uh, I, I'll take note of them. Okay. <laughs> Kari Usladen, Nupi, a pleasure to listening to you. Um, given your background from the Balkans, I wanted to ask you about that. Um, so the recent Berlin summit failed to restart the stalled Kosovo-Serb relation uh, and the talks. Um, could I ask you to please share your reflections on that as for the, the talks, uh, the summit, but also as for what could be done? Thanks. Okay, two different regions. Uh, so the uh, short-range missiles fired alliance management. Yeah. Well, uh, obviously what you're speaking to is the issue from the Japanese point of view. It's not long-range multi-stage missiles they're just worried about. And uh, I think uh, um, Prime Minister Abe has done a good job of explaining that to Trump over, you know, lengthy sessions of golf. Uh, I, uh, I think um, the North Koreans are trying to get American attention. And one of the things they like the most is to kind of split uh, the U.S. and Japan, the U.S. and other partners. So I think uh, it was for effect to create a circumstance where the Japanese are worried. Um, I think from the U.S. perspective, they were right not to make it a showstopper, not to kind of end the uh, um, the talks over this issue of short-term term missiles. But at the same time, I, I think it speaks to the fact that we need um, kind of, we need Japan at the table and uh, we need to have kind of a kind of continuous discussion with the Japanese. I, I think Pompeo has probably done a better job with Kono than he has with some of the others, with the Japanese than he has with some of the others. But I think this problem is a very serious problem, and I think the North Koreans know exactly what they're doing. Uh, now, by the way, these short-term missiles were even, they could not reach Japan, but clearly they're kind of get at the issue of calibrating what they're prepared to do. Um, uh, there was another aspect to your question. Well, uh, alliance uh, management. Yeah, yeah. Um, w which is related to that, but I think alliance management is much better when we're all in the talks together. Now, I must say, you know, I'd go on my way to these talks, and I'd st we'd stop in Seoul or Tokyo, and we'd have the Koreans and the Japanese, you know, the, th <laughs> the three baseball-playing countries in the six-party talks, and I must say, I, I, it was awful because the Japanese and the Koreans were always fighting with each other, and I found myself mediating, and uh, it was not very helpful, but uh, I think in the long run, our interests are well served by Japan and Korea, who also develop some patterns of cooperation. And so um, it's not going to happen tomorrow, and I think Americans need to be respectful of history, which, which isn't just what happened last Tuesday. History is what has happened over the centuries, and I think we need to be more respectful of that. But I, uh, I think it's in our interest to try to get Japan and Korea to work together, and I think we can do it better if they're in the process. Um, China and Russia, you know, there's a lot of talk about they're, you know, we're pushing them together. I don't think we really are. And frankly speaking, I'm a little skeptical of this idea that China and Russia are going to team up against us. Uh, but, you know, that situation does need to be watched. And I can see sort of tactical alliances between those two countries against us. But I, I, I think if we got to some kind of six-party talks, and I don't care what they call it, I mean, if they're so 
traumatized by by the idea that it would be Bush's initiative, then fine, call it something else, call it four plus two or two plus four, or we've, you know, uh, one one against five, whatever they want to talk about. But I, I we need better diplomatic architecture because, first of all, if you're discussing with one other person, then ha and the whole world is watching. The tendency is that half the world will blame you and half the world will blame the other guy. So, I mean, we put ourselves in needless position, whereas when it's five on one, and we did have five on one most of the time, uh, I think it's much better for our interests. But uh, I don't think I could convince Donald Trump of that in a million years. Could you um, say on, a um, few words about on, the Balkans? Uh, yeah, I mean, there were ideas about maybe uh, doing something with Mitrovica and maybe swapping it for, because uh, Mitrovica north of the river, of course, is, is Serb territory, and then swapping it for, oh God, not the Livno Valley, Preshovo Valley, thank you, yeah. Very good, Al. The ambassador to Macedonia. <laughs> but, um, and uh, the Germans said absolutely not, uh, but I think there was some interest among e e EU countries. I was talking to my former uh, partner in all this, uh, Wolfgang Petrich uh, from Austria, about this, and he said, "We, are, you know, if you know, you can do a land swap if both people agree to it." Um, I don't think there's an, there's quite enough um, support for these kinds of things in the Serb government and the um, and the uh, and the Kosovo government, and. If there were some clear result, like instant European Union membership, but I, I don't think that's on offer right now, nor should it be. So uh, I think I would like to see us more present in the Balkans. Now we have a new Assistant Secretary in Europe, Phil Reeker. He, uh, he was with me in all the Kosovo stuff. He, he was the Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Balkans later on. He knows the Balkans. So I, I feel we have a little more uh, you know, understanding of the Balkans, but I, I'd like to see the Americans more active. I, I consider it some of our our handy work, and uh, I think um, we need to, you know, this Kosovo, if it's going to work, it needs better relations with its neighbors, and that'll overcome the problems of the five remaining countries in Cyprus, Greece, Slovakia, Spain, and I always rem forget the fifth. Oh, Serbia, yeah. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much to all of you for coming here today. We have to be mindful about the time because some of you have other appointments. Uh, so sorry for some of you who have not been able to ask your question and to get in. Yeah, we could have probably have this, con this conversation <laughs> going for, for hours. But uh, please join me in uh, thanking uh, Christopher Hill thank for you. his uh, sharing his insights. Thank you Thank so you much. very much. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you.